For many black Americans, the American medical and education systems cause trepidation and skepticism because of a lack of trust, access, equal opportunity for the community. To discuss how these entities can be reformed, we're joined by Dr. Judy Lubin, sociologist and founder and president of the Center for Urban and Racial Equity, CURE. And Michael D. Smith, Director of Youth Opportunity Programs and Executive Director, a really cool crowd. My Brother's Keeper Alliance at the Obama Foundation, about which you know we've heard so much over the years. Really appreciate you both thanking us. And I wanted to say, say a shout out because we were going to be joined by Akil Ross, who's an education consultant. He was a former National High School Principal of the Year. His broadband's not working out today, but Akil, I promise you, I want to bring you back and we can continue this conversation because we're not going to do this just in a one shot today. So um, thank you so much. I hope he's watching right now. But let me just open this up. You know, I, I, you know, as we think both about mentoring young men and we think about you know, trying to get greater equity and health justice, if you will, you know, in our society. It's really a trust issue in, in, in many ways. And, you know, Judy, I'd just love to kind of get your dashboard on how you think about uh, somehow getting those that are skeptical, who feel like the cards have been stacked against them for so long in so many different ways, to finally say, OK, we push reset, we trust the system. How do you do that? Yeah, thanks so much, Steve, for having me and for hosting this important conversation. I think it's critical that as we're thinking about how do we increase vaccine uptake in uh, the Black community, that we really do think about not just the historical uh, legacy of medical abuse and uh, racism, but also that a lot of the mistreatment and and, uh, medical uh, uh, bias that people are are drawing their decisions around this COVID-19 vaccine is, is recent, right? People have real lived experience of being disrespected within clinical settings. And so this is something that uh, medical professionals and public health professionals have to uh, build trust, right? That's the work of, of us to do. I, I consider myself a public uh, health practitioner. This is how I first started my work. Doing racial equity work is grounded community public health and public education. And so it's our job to uh, not only name and recognize the history, but mm-hmm. also to, mm-hmm. to, to roll out the vaccines in a way that helped to support trust. And we like to say equity, you sometimes have to move at the speed of trust, right? And it's a real challenge when you're trying to roll out a vaccine really quickly and you have uh, distrust in the community, right? Mer- merited and legitimate questions that are being asked about the vaccine. And so we need to see really large scale uh, public service uh, education campaigns. I'm hearing people not even knowing that there are vaccines uh, available within their neighborhoods. Like, why isn't there signage mm. available for people to know that there are vaccine vaccination sites in their neighborhood? So there's a lot more work that needs to be done in terms of building relationships with trusted messengers, with right. faith leaders, you know, barber shops, our beauty shops, our, our churches, those trusted institutions and 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 uh, and community assets in order to distribute the vaccines, but also to ask, for people to answer, have their questions answered is really critical, right? That it's not just providing the vaccines, but providing space for people to, to ask questions. Judy, uh, I, I want to go to, you know, Michael in a second, you know, and I'm so excited to talk to him because he's also about, you know, trusted messengers and mentors, et cetera, which I, I find so important in this conversation. But I, I guess, you know, over the last year, I've interviewed just about everybody big in the coronavirus story. You know, Anthony Fauci, Robert Redfield, Deborah Burks. Um, and along the way, I would ask them during the point, I said, what's your communications plan? Are you building in trusted messages for different parts of the community? I would always get the message from Jerome Adams, the Surgeon General. Yes, yes, don't worry. We know there's skepticism. We have a communications plan. So let me just ask you, did their communications plan that they say, said they had, is it working? Well, I would say it's clear, right, that it isn't working. And I'm still asking where that communication plan is, right? I think certainly since the Biden administration has come into office, we're beginning to see um, some some, uh, structure around the vaccine rollout. And we're beginning to see like real clear communication that black and brown communities are gonna be prioritized. But I think certainly a lot more needs to be done, right? This needs to be visible, right? Uh, in neighborhoods. We also need to be hearing about it on on radio and TV, right? That people know like that we we need visibility around eligibility. eligibility. (laughs) So there are all these different phases, right? Populations that are being prioritized. We should know like, what are these phases? When am I gonna be able to access the vaccines? 
there should be a number, a national number that links people to local uh, resources and local vaccination sites. Right. Right? So I think there are a lot of a lot of lessons to be learned around how to reach communities of color. I think there are a lot of lessons to learn from political organizing. I mean, we saw a massive turnout just this last year for the presidential election, right? So there are people, right, in our communities, Black women, uh, Black-led organizations that know how to reach folks, and they need to be tapped into, provided the resources in order for us to increase vaccination uptake. I'm so glad you said that, because I've been looking for that communications plan, too. But, Michael... um, I love my brother's keeper. I love, you know, what you do in, in, in reducing youth violence, mentorship. And it just was such a, I honestly, when you look back at the Obama administration, many things that, you know, but this is one of those that you come up and just like both real hard and it did something. And let me just ask you, if, if, if my brother's keeper didn't exist, what would the lives of many of your students and your young people look like today? Well, thanks for the question and thanks for having me here. I I think the importance of My Brother's Keeper, we're actually coming up on our seventh anniversary on February 27th. My Brother's Keeper was founded after the tragic killing of Trayvon Martin and the even more shocking um, acquittal of George Zimmerman. And it was really started to say to the nation from the president of the United States, boys and young men of color, you matter. Your dreams matter, your hopes matter. And we need to do everything as a nation to make sure that you can succeed. Uh, President Obama talked about at that time that making sure that our young men of color can achieve their dreams is the most important thing that we can do as a nation. Um, And it's not just something from our heart, it's the head. We know if America is gonna stay globally competitive, if our communities are gonna be resilient, we have to make sure that we're benefiting from the talents um, and hopes and opportunities of our young men. And frankly, because of systemic racism, uh, because of barriers that exist in education and employment, far too many of our young men were not able to reach their full potential. So because of My Brother's Keeper, there is now a network of hundreds of communities across the country where you have city governments, businesses, nonprofits, all working together to make that pathway from cradle to college and career and beyond much clearer and to have real honest conversations about how racism shows up in that, how gender bias shows up in that, so we can disrupt those systems that are no longer working. Let me ask you, you know, because as we're thinking about change right now, one of the things I told uh, my team when we put this program together, I didn't want to just check off the box and say, oh, it's Black History Month, let's do a program. I really want to kind of elevate and talk about things that we continue to keep our eyeball on, that we can, you know, and we have been doing this very consistently every month, more and more programs along these, um, you know, social and economic and really health justice issues across the way. But being embedded in a presidential administration helps, doesn't it? I mean, it certainly helps. I, you know, as as a, a then a younger man of color that I am now, um, even though I was working on the My Brother's Keeper initiative, I stood in the back of the East Room of the White House uh, when the president was announcing My Brother's Keeper, and I had tears running down my face. And I remember hiding a little bit because I was standing next to a uniformed Marine and I wanted to appear manly. Um, but I remember how much that meant to me growing up um, in a in a school system. I was in a busing program where I was called the N-word. Um, I remember at the time feeling that there were dreams that I couldn't achieve. I remember still myself being first. You know, my, my grandmother grew up in the segregated South, and so it mattered that the president of the United States was saying, you know what? Race and gender is at play here, and we've got to do something. We've got to get to the root causes and see what we can do, not just have a conversation about race, not just figure out how we can take some kids to a baseball game, but let's study the science. Let's look at the research and let's see what we can do to break this horrific trend that we're seeing. So it mattered. And in the Obama administration, we had 22 federal agencies and White House offices that were moving policy, ban the box, second chance Pell, chronic absenteeism, all was changing as a result of my brother's keeper. Uh, But the other thing that I think we found was important is it gave air cover for mayors and small towns and business leaders to say, we can talk about race too. We can do something about this, this problem. And today, Seven years later, we still have hundreds of communities and thousands of partners uh, that are making a difference for our boys and young men and their families. It's such an important story. I love this story. We should, I hope you're going to come back and talk to me. I want to give Judy the last word in this. We never have enough time because I love your program and I want to learn more about Judy's. But, but Judy would say, you know, I just asked this question about being embedded in this administration. We talked to Maxine uh, Waters and Barbara Lee earlier, both of whom seem optimistic. They said, you know, we've got, you know, people of color in important positions, women of color in important positions. We have the president of the United States who talk about systemic racism uh, in his impeach, you know, in, in his impeachment, in his uh, uh, inauguration address. Excuse me, folks. Um, 
what I guess I want to ask you is, do you feel as you're looking at getting essentially a reset and a reordering of, I, I don't know how to put it, winners and losers, so that there are more winners. You expand the pie of those that benefit and that are included in a healthy track. Do you think the White House is, is, is part of that now? And do you have the tools you need? I think the White House is certainly a part of it, but we'd love to see the administration go further, right? We need bold, transformative policies that really get at the root of structural racism and structural inequities in this country. So we'd love to see Democrats in Congress and love to see the Biden administration get on board on some of those policies like a federal jobs guarantee, right? Particularly in our communities that are being hardest hit by COVID-19 and experiencing economic distress, right? That we need a federal jobs guarantee so that anyone who wants a job can have a livable, uh, a, a job that pays a li livable wage and that they're able to take care of their families and themselves. And this is critically, critically important uh, for our communities, for us to be thinking about uh, uh, the, the recovery in a way that's going to be equitable to ensure jobs, to ensure there's affordable housing, right? We have an affordable housing crisis across this country that particularly impacts black communities, right? We're only 13% of the population and 40% of, of all homeless persons in this country. And so housing is a major issue and can be used as the center or a cornerstone mm. for our equitable recovery and infrastructure building uh, plan. Well, it's so great to talk to both of you. I hope we can do more of this. Judy Lubin, founder and president of the Center for Urban and Racial e Equity Cure. Michael Smith, director of the Youth Opportunity Programs and executive director of My Brother's Keeper, the MBK Alliance and the Obama Foundation. You're both doing great work. I'm really happy to have just heard. I mean, I just feel like, wow, you know, this, some of this stuff is so heavy, but I feel like you're both making a big difference. I'm really grateful for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Steve.